I, I tend to get hungry quite often here, but up there when I got hungry, my uh, energy level went down considerably. And each time I'd take a meal, it was like a shot in the arm. My energy level went boomed right up back up to the level that it had been uh, prior to the uh, time that I'd kind of run out of gas from lack of food and it was right back up again. And the point that I'm making is that we can go the long duration flights, but I think we have to be sure that we provide adequate food. I think Jim went through the same cycle each time that he didn't eat, and as soon as he ate, we were right back up on a good working level. The food was very, very important. How was Sam? Uh, certainly. Uh, we really saw, I saw three things that looked to me they were like they were satellites of the Earth. I saw one over the I saw two over the Pacific, I guess. One, uh, I don't have the times right with me, but one over near Hawaii. The uh, spacecraft was in free drifting flight at the time. Uh, I had been looking inside the spacecraft and I glanced out. As I did, I saw a white object. It looked like it was uh, cylindrical. and had. Uh, it looked to me like there was a white arm sticking out of it. It really could have been a reflection on another piece of it. Uh, I can't tell you the range. It looked to me like it was uh, within 10 or 15 miles, certainly. And the sunlight was shining on it so that it, it stood out quite well. I had the movie camera mounted on the, on the windshield, so I turned it on. I quickly grabbed the Hasselblad camera that we had with us, and I snapped a picture with it, and I reached over and grabbed the Conorex camera. I didn't know what the settings were on any of these cameras, but I, I felt that we ought to get a picture of this. Well, unfortunately, the spacecraft being in drifting flight drifted up so that the, the sun came across the window right at that time. And when the sun shines full on the window, you just absolutely can't see out. So I lost sight of it. And then I had it in sight for about 30 seconds, possibly. I, we saw an, another one at night. It looked like a, just a pinpoint of light in the sky, the same way that it does that satellites look from the ground when they're very high. And I saw another one over the western Pacific, uh, again, just shortly uh, before I got into the sunlight on the windshield. This one was much farther away. I tried to take a picture of it also. The only one that I could even define the shape of at all was the first one. It looked like it, it looked a lot like uh, an upper stage of a booster. If I had to classify it as, as a known object, I'd, I'd classify it as that. But I really didn't see enough of it to, to really say for sure what it was. Jules Bergman. Jim and Ed, uh, there's been much discussion of just how much detail men in space can make out about objects on Earth. What were the smallest sized objects you were able to pick out both from outside the spacecraft, Ed, during EVA and from inside, Jim, during the course of the flight? Go ahead, Ed. Why don't you answer that first? Well, I, I was quite surprised to see how much you really can see with just your unaided eye up there. I could look down into cities, uh, both in the day and the night. I could see uh, what I felt in much greater detail than I could just flying from an aircraft at 40,000 feet. I also felt uh, I wasn't looking down and picking out the uh, individual buildings or this type of thing. When you'd see a city, you'd see the outline and the details, and you could see the roads. And the seas, you could see the ships, you could see the wakes very clearly, and uh, if you use your uh, imagination, I suppose you could almost see the ship, but I can't honestly say that I saw the ships. I could see the wakes very clearly. At night, I, I was quite impressed with the clarity that you could see the lights outlining a city when the atmosphere is clear. I went over a city in Australia, I believe it was uh, Sydney at one night, it was very, very clear, and I looked down, and it looked like uh, almost a fine, fine strings of lights where the, the street lights and the uh, roads were lighted. It was the, like a fine uh, spider web uh, of lights, much, much clearer in detail than I could see in the normal night. It's a little more blurry at, at night from the air. Also, uh, from outside the spacecraft, I didn't specifically try to observe items. The area that I think I looked at closest was a Texas coastline as I came over. Jim called out and said, I think we're over Texas. And then he says, a matter of fact, I believe we're over, the, uh, over Houston. And at that time, I was in a position that I could look down. And I saw the, uh, the Gulf. And I went on into Clear Lake, Taylor Lake. I could see the 
the outline of uh, the small lakes down there very clearly. And uh, I didn't take time to look for the manned spacecraft center. I, I think if I had a look for the, the center and taken the time to focus down there, I, I believe that I could have seen objects of this size very clearly. The thing that impressed me was the, the clarity with which you can see objects down there. We looked down at uh, roads. You could see airfields. You could see the runway outlines very clearly. Uh, I was very impressed with it. I think uh, one, one thing that's very important, Jules, is a, is a contrast between the thing you're looking at and the surrounding terrain. And, and long features tend to stand out better than do uh, square ones. If you, if you saw a, an object of a given width, if it were very long, you'd be able to see it. If it were the same length as it was wide, uh, I don't think you'd be able to see it nearly as well. Uh, another thing on this, on this vision, quite often, we, as we would go into the sun set or come out of in a sunrise, we'd have one window with the light shining on it and the other window facing the dark side. And you couldn't see a thing out the, out the light side window, but out, the, out the, the dark side, you could see all the stars. It's just like uh, you were living in two different worlds, like someone had drawn a line right through the middle of the spacecraft. One, one side was it in pitch darkness, you could see all the stars. The other side, you could see the, the horizon turning uh, light blue, but no stars whatsoever. It was very interesting. Herb Capelo. Was there any time on the flight or after you were down where either one of you didn't feel good or noticed some physical irregularity? <laughs> I felt fine all the time. I was sleepy or tired, I guess is the... What period of time are you referring to? <laughs> there was some mention about your eyes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, as a matter of fact, my eyes uh, did bother me during the early portions of the flight. Uh, I guess we had some sort of an irritant in the, in the atmosphere in the cabin, and they did bother me. Around 24 hours, they were bothering a fair amount, but it, it continued to clear up so that by the time I landed, I really didn't have any trouble with them at all. And on the whole flight, you both felt good? Yes, sir. I was sleepy and hungry at times, but uh, aside from that, I felt fine. And what about when you got down in the water and you first stood up? I didn't have any trouble. I, I disconnected myself from the spacecraft after I'd opened the hatch, which weighs a considerable amount, and uh, disconnected myself from the, all my leads. I put my, uh, I had my neck dam on and my, my gloves on so that my wa suit was watertight. I inflated my Mae West and I jumped over the back end into the life raft. So I wasn't having any trouble at all. Same with you, Major White? Yeah, the only time during the flight that I felt any discomfort was when I was hungry, and I took care of that. Uh, readily 15 times during the flight. We ate 15 meals. When we got down in the water, the uh, best jump I made was out of the spacecraft and into the uh, life raft. I didn't feel any discomfort. I had a uh, wave of nausea of about 15 seconds and uh, while I was in the spacecraft, about 10 minutes after I landed. In fact, I was quite surprised at how good I felt after that was gone. It, uh, I was quite surprised myself. You know, we'd been briefed pretty thoroughly on what we should do and what we could expect and uh, there wasn't anything we had to do, and we, uh, we didn't expect anything. Do you attribute that to the bouncing of the spacecraft in the water? Yes, I do. <laughs> Charles Shutt, <laughs> Major White, in relation to your walk in space, would it have been helpful to you to have a longer tether? And from your experience, do you think that man will have any trouble working for longer periods of time? I, I think that's a good question. Uh, Yes, I would have liked to have had a longer tether, and, but more than that, I would have rather had about 10 times the supply of uh, propellant for my maneuvering gun. And I think, yes, man, will maneuver in space. I think quite, uh, quite a bit. I think that what we really demonstrated is that man can go from point A to point B with some kind of a, uh, aid, such as the maneuvering unit that we had. Uh, let me see, was there another part to your question, or did I answer the parts? Oh, yes, I knew there was no, no. Keep going. Yes, I think you could, I would have been uh, more than uh, happy to have stayed out and worked longer. I think I, temperature-wise, I was the most comfortable when I was out of the spacecraft on the, in the EVA portion than I was at any other time. The, uh, during the flight, I had a fairly heavy suit on, and, and it seemed like I was warm throughout the whole flight, except for the one portion in which I was out EVA and the temperature then I would classify as extremely comfortable. 
personal observations you made up there? I mean, was there any feeling of exhilaration or anything of this nature? No, people have asked me, did I feel exhilarated? And no, I felt, I felt very thankful to, to have been able to, to uh, take part in this part and to represent the people up there. Uh, I don't know how to put it to you, but I, I didn't feel uh, any uh, feeling of fear. I felt well trained for it, and I felt completely natural out there. Bart Snyder. I'd like to ask you about uh, the actual exertion during EVA. When on the ground you had a pulse rate of about 50, and during EVA it jumped to about 150, and then when you stepped back in the capsule it jumped to about 186. How would that compare with the exertion uh, in running as you did, running a distance run? Well, I think that uh, we have pretty good documentation of, of what my pulse rates go to on the ground. I think that when we ran the altitude chamber test, and I worked pretty hard in that big suit during the altitude chamber runs, I think if they go back over the data, I remember I inquired of them after these runs that my pulse rates went up in the vicinity of the figures that you quoted. And I think that when I go out and, and, uh, and do run, which I do on a rather regular basis, that a pulse rate of, of uh, in the vicinity of 150 is is not ab abnormal when I really uh, put out. I think it's a pretty normal indication for me. Were you when breathing hard, you believe? Two times uh, did I breathe hard, and one was when I was mounting the camera uh, just before I went back out to be sure that it was running. And the other time is when I was uh, uh, closing the hatch with the assistance of Jim. All right. Young lady. In regard to that big suit that you were just making a comment about, I'd like to ask you, how comfortable was the EVA suit for you? Did you remove parts of it, such as the sleeve and so forth? And finally, what changes would you recommend be made to this suit? Well, I, I figured somebody was going to ask me that question. The, uh, the suit, I thought, was well designed to perform the uh, mission for which it was designed for. I'd spent hours and hours in it to become accustomed to it. In fact, in my flight suit, uh, they were worried I'd worn it out. I spent over 50 hours in my number one flight suit. And in fact, I wore my, uh, what, I, what originally was my number two flight suit, this is the one I wore on my, my flight. So as far as the suit was concerned, uh, I felt comfortable in it throughout the mission. I had no, as just Jim uh, mentioned also, I had no pressure points when I came down. The suit during the mission, I think, provided me with the uh, maneuverability and uh, capability to get around the spacecraft that I needed. The sleeves were something that uh, Jim and I had worked out together and had decided that uh, if we went in the heavy suits, we would have the sleeves removable. And after the EVA work was over, uh, Jim actually removed the sleeves. He unvelcroed the Velcro down the back and pulled them off through my harness. and. Uh, kept them underneath his legs for the rest of the flight. Uh, as far as do we need this kind of suit on later flights, that's a pretty tough one to answer. I think that uh, the work that we're doing now to find out what kind of a hazard do we have from micrometeoroids and temperature problems do we have up there will better solve the, this problem than for me to tell you right now. I think the equipment that I had, though, I felt extremely confident in. I felt very confident in the suit. I was happy to have the visor, which was a quite a well-protected visor. I had uh, a uh, coating of gold across the front of my visor to keep the heat in, keep my visor from clouding. I had a coating in my visor so that I could look directly at the sun. And during one portion of the flight, I actually looked right straight at the sun. It was during the time that I was mounting the camera. I had no alternative. The sun was right up behind the adapter, and I had to look right smack into the sun throughout this period in which I was operating. And this is when I called into Jim. I said, I'm sure glad I have this visor on because I'm working and looking right into the sun.